Maxim was barely out of the house to work in their yard when Liliana's mother, Mrs. Vazlenko, confronted Liliana. He says you have not been returning his phone calls, she queried with consternation. He says you have been telling us fables, that you were with that Canadian, a geologist. He's from the United States, mother, she countered, bothered at her mother's use of the word us, as if Maxim were family. Recently, Liliana's mother had grown fond of reporting Maxim's comings and goings, but in this instance, the plural first-person form made Liliana wince. The two had been arguing for days. Liliana's mood turned stormy after Peter left. So far, Peter had been gone a week, and his hiatus had opened her eyes to her mother's controlling nature. Liliana was not entirely free living at home, but what else had she? Part of the price of rent was being audience to her mother's whinging. However, underneath she felt a daughter's duty to stay home. The stark reality was that Liliana's job was their sole regular income outside a paltry government pension from her late father's service to a former truck company, now defunct. Many such companies had become obsolete due to out-of-date methods, then outmoded products, and a loss of consumer confidence in a free market. Indeed, per the usual Soviet government approach, outdated factories kept pumping out inferior products merely to keep its members working. Mr. Vasilenko had been so fortunate. Seeing change coming, however, Mrs. Vasilenko, for the last five years under the communist, had mended garments for the neighboring households, that is, the few upwardly rising economic classes in her suburbs. After independence, even while she grew her business relationships and perfected her craft, the work was sporadic and income was unreliable. The Vasilenko house was their only economic holding, a large home started in the 1920s which had survived the Nazis. Mr. Vasilenko had devoted his life to restore it. It had two floors of stone and mortar, which took 20 years to repair, a solid single-piece wood banister which he had made from a tree from his uncle's farm, a chandelier which he had smuggled out of Austria, a kitchen with an oversized sink and private washing room for which renovation he had worked extra days at his factory for nine years to save. The house was his monument. To his daughter, Liliana, the residence was his voice that spoke to her. To his wife, it was her pride and position among the women her age in town, and someday her legacy to her only child. Maxim will be here this Sunday for supper, she abruptly announced. It was not unexpected. Maxim had been vocal he was interested in helping the two women. Furthermore, to show his support, he had performed small chores around their place. He had fixed the small push mower and dug new fence posts where the others had fallen over. Yet Liliana knew why they had frequently seen him. His mood clearly showed. Truth told, Maxim was a likable man, a bit older than her, in physical prime. He looked handsome in the way a rascally child engenders a stranger's smile. He could laugh and make a friend out of the most troubled face. His demeanor hinted at mischievousness without malice. He seemed moody, but affable and forgivable with his quick tongue and beguiling grin. Worse for Liliana, Maxim's traits had completely captivated Mrs. Vasilenko. And I am to do what about it? Liliana answered under her breath, merely to speak her mind. Another Sunday came, a full day, or so it seemed, with Maxim in the house. Moreover, he started unannounced midweek visits for additional repairs, a door hinge that required tightening and oil, a leak to stop, and drains and gutters to clean from wayward leaves. As matters progressed, Liliana noticed Maxim recurrently leaving or walking into her home without a specific invitation. Mrs. Vasilenko was quite happy at Maxim's progress and dedication to her requests. Maxim himself prioritized the list of patch-ups and restorations with Mrs. Vasilenko's eager consent. The weather moving towards summer's end turned pleasant. Some days had rain, but most were sunny with cool evenings that put the city's residents in good humor. With so many fixing Sundays, Liliana was pressed to thank Maxim for his cleverness at mending items left unrepaired since her father's passing. I'm grateful that you're grateful, he replied as he leaned against the light pole outside the old house. Maxim gave Liliana a wink for her gratitude. Liliana's gratitude was the acknowledgement he wanted, indeed, for which he had waited. Liliana looked fetching in the electric glow of the streetlight. Her bright eyes and shining hair showed unsullied health. 
She'll make a fine mother, thought Maxim as he grabbed her arm and pulled her towards his chest. I'm not that grateful, she pushed back, for his reply hinted at disingenuousness. Maxim's character was veneered in his own self-appreciation. While Liliana's mother appeared incapable of seeing his superficiality, Liliana fully saw it, yet she accepted Maxim's full attention as it was relatively flattering. You need a man around this house, Maxim seized the moment. You should see how much more there is to do, things that have been let go, some that were not well done in the first place. The original siding is mildewed and the privacy wall on the north side is rotted. Its stone masonry is cracked on the south corner. Maxim listed the endless list, exaggerating most, as he watched for a sign of agreement and sympathy in Liliana's face. Indeed, the house was in need of repair, which Liliana knew. The house was dying, and its corners cried for help. Like the house, her life too seemed to have been better in distant days. As Maxim's pressure mounted with his incessant chatter about his indispensable help, her mood sank into a malaise. He argued he could resurrect the old place, but she read a double meaning in his words. Young and strong as she was, she felt tired and giftless, without passion to throw at someone's feet. Could Maxim resurrect her joie de vivre? Maxim, Liliana scolded as she broke from his confinement. I must attend my work I have brought home. She lied, as there was no work. It was easy to lie to Maxim, and she felt no guilt. She quietly slipped into her room and closed the door and remained motionless on her bed. Darkness settled atop the summer's day. The house cooled and she drew covers over herself. However, she could not stop supposing. Her job was not a shelter. Her mother provided no emotional support. Her age brought uncertainty, yet her mother would become her obligation as she advanced in years. Her home's familiarity was her comfort, her warm blanket, a refuge to supply her neediness. Her neighborhood in the city she knew well was her comrade. Was this awareness the only consolation for her uneasy soul which she desired? For a brief moment, her thoughts drifted. She remembered Peter's touch when they had coffee in the rain. She wondered what he was doing at that moment, where his travels had recently taken him, and if he would truly return, even briefly. As she catalogued her pleasant recollections, she remembered the plant in the old building, the tears of Persia. She was its security, its love, if plants felt love. Truly the nurture and support, even encouragement she had given it, had saved it. She also remembered how Peter, too, was her inspiration. She knew she could never lie to Peter the way she did with Maxim, yet he could not nurture her far away, so far. She was the plant, and only Maxim had promised to care for her. He had said he cherished her. She swore at the night. Making plans is like betting the odds.